thing. Well, this is equipping hour, so I hope you're ready to get some equipment. And I have an equipping uh, presentation ready. Um, and it has to do with, it has to do with um, our ancestors, our ancestors. When I was a little kid, my parents were partying. That's what they did. And they left me in the room in the back of the house. And they said, just do something. Don't bother us. We're partying. And so I started watching a, a, a show, and I shouldn't have been allowed to watch this show. And it was called Quest for Fire. And I was glued to the movie, because it was an adult movie. And they had, uh, they had um, I guess they were actors dressed as ape men, and, and they, kind of, they never talked. There was not a single word of dialogue in the movie. It was just grunts and cries and screams the whole movie. <laughs> That's how they sort of communicated, and they walked around and stooped like this. And eight men at that point became real in my young and impressionable mind. And so I thought, well, that's where we must have come from, because I saw it in the movies, eight men. And um, so as I grew up and I listened to Bible stories and I read a little bit of the Bible, it doesn't say anything about my origins from apes. It only talks about me coming from Adam. And so I had to pick, I have to select an option here, because either I came from apes, like the secular scientists say, like my TV programs taught me as I was passively learning by being entertained. My parents even taught it. They said, yeah, of course we came from apes. That's what the scientists say. We have to believe that. Well, if I came from apes, then the Bible got it wrong. And so later on, I got, um, I went through a creation conversion where I came to the Lord, realized that the Bible got it right when it talks about me being a sinner because I knew I had sins because I know myself. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I am a sinner. And it said, you, there's a savior for that. So I said, I need the Savior to save me from my sins. So I knew that part of the Bible was right, so I went back into this issue, went back to Genesis, and I started to look at it again, and I wanted to know, is the science that supports ape man ancestry so solid that I have to take an exacto knife and cut out all those verses in the scripture that refer to our origins in Adam? Did the Bible get it wrong? And does science disprove what the Bible teaches about Adam? So what did I do? I got resources. I got books. I investigated. And I went through each one of the um, supposed ape man ancestors. And every time I investigated one of those, I found out that the science was not as solid as I, as I originally thought. And so I'm going to equip you with some trends that I found in my investigation. So by the end of our equipping hour, you'll be able to say, ah, here comes the headline announcing the new latest missing link. But wait, I'm going to wait for the next headline that's going to announce that other scientists disagree that it even should be called a missing link. And so what we find is disagreement among evolutionary scientists about every single supposed missing link so far proposed and that's the trend that's one of the trends that, that we found and so so you don't have to feel intimidated by these announcements and you're gonna you're gonna i'm gonna give you some equipment on on some ways to um, um some basically some categories categories because all these uh, all these uh, uh, supposed transitional forms they actually end up fitting into one of three categories and none of those categories is evolutionary ancestor none of them three different categories and these categories capture all the missing links um, why is this important guys if the bible got it wrong then this erodes our confidence in the very gospel L listen to what paul says in first corinthians and so it is written the first man adam became a living being the last adam who's the last adam Fire. the lord jesus 
So the first atom was a type of the last atom. And um, the last atom became a life-giving spirit. So, so without the first atom, to com- as a real human, to compare to the last atom, then what does that do to the to our Christology? It erodes our confidence that the Lord Jesus was a man, was a real human descended from Adam. The scripture says he was. He was also God. And so, so here we go. Ready? Are you ready to get equipped with the three categories? Okay. One whoop. It's a little early, I know. Well, we're going to use four examples to illustrate the three categories that I've discovered. Um, all these supposed eight men fit into these three categories. So far, well, the first example is going to be a little um, a creature, a fossilized creature called Ida. Then we'll look at Lucy just a bit. Then uh, Homo habilis briefly. And a Neanderthal man. And actually modern man we're not going to look at because you look at him or her in the mirror most mornings. Now as we go through these, each of these examples, I'm going to have this little icon of a golf ball. So I'm going to do this. We're just going to do this together just to make sure that we're awake. Um, when I introduce a supposed missing link, I'm going to grab a golf ball and plug it into the ground like I'm about to golf with it. Anyway, so I'll say, let's tee it up. I'll go like this, grab it. I'll say, let's, and then we all together say, tee it up. And then, so let's practice, let's tee it up. And then, then I'll talk about the headline. I'll talk about what was said about this new missing link. And then we get to um, do this. I'm going to grab my, my golf club, and I'm going to swing it. And as I swing it, I'm going to say, let's, and then we all say, knock it out. Ready? Let's knock it out. So we're going to tee it up, and then we'll let, guess what? You don't have to listen to some crazy Bible-believing scientist like me. We're going to let the evolutionary scientists knock it out themselves because they constantly refute one another in their bickering and that's what we'll see one of the trends oh look it's our first one so let's tee it up and it's ida fossil ida look fossil ida extraordinary find it is the missing link finally we got the missing link so this is april i think spring of 2009 and of course this came out of the headlines and so what do we have to do at the institute for creation research we have to investigate it and then we have to come up with a response so i had to read the technical journal article and then I had to um, write a news article, post it online at icr.org. And, um, well, there it is. Look at that fossil creature. Does it look like a missing link? <laughs> well, it looks like something. Something died. Splat. Teeing it up still, this is what they said. This little creature is going to show us our connection with all the rest of the animals. Uh, the guy um, promoting it. Uh, said this will be the one pictured in textbooks for the next hundred years. By the way, it's more than a decade later and it's not even in the textbooks. So he just he just wanted it to be pictured in the textbooks for the next hundred years because that would give him fame, fortune, and glory. They all want to be rock stars, paleo rock stars. <laughs> so that's well, just the month after he oh they had a National Geographic special in the evenings. I don't know if you remember that, but it was like, we're going to run a special because this is the new missing link. But scientists with cooler heads and more analytical minds started to compare the fossil appendages, that's the legs and arms of Ida, to modern animals. On the bottom you see Ida's legs, and on the top you see a, a, a living animal's legs. And guess what? They found a match. So it looks exactly like a modern animal and it leaps from tree to tree. It's about this big. Any ideas on what it is? It's a leaping lemur. It's a lemur. And so they, so they published news. Uh, uh, it made the low lines. The headlines were missing link. But the low lines were controversial Ida fossil, no missing link. Oh, you know why it's not a missing link? It's just a dead lemur. A lemur died. Does that mean I have to take an X-Acto knife and chop the Bible to pieces because a lemur died? And oh, answer no. In fact, it kind of demonstrates what Genesis said all along. Genesis chapter 1 says 10 times 
God created these creatures to reproduce according to its kind, according to its kind, according to their kind, plants and animals, according to the kind, which means we would expect to see lemurs making more lemurs. And they have a unique anatomy. It's a lemur anatomy with that crooked back leg that you saw. See it? Sort of like, it's great for leaping, by the way. Leaping lemurs. Okay, so that's, oh, let's do this. We get to, let's knock it out. We're going to knock it out. You don't have to listen to me. You don't have to go get a PhD in paleoanthropology to knock it out. Just read the news. And here's what they said. Bone crunching. That's comparing the the uh, the bone shapes. Uh, debunks first monkey, Ida, as hype. It was all hype, no science. Anyway, first category, dead animal. Just because you have a dead animal. By the way, we're... Why do we have dead animals? Animals die because of Genesis chapter 3, the curse. If you eat of the fruit, dying you will die, as God promised in Genesis 2. And then because you've done this, cursed is the ground for your sake, and now you're going to have to die. And so now death has been a death has been part of this world ever since Genesis 3, very early in creation. And we've needed a rescue from death. We needed someone to rescue us because we can't rescue ourselves. And the Lord Jesus provides that rescue. He says, I'll rescue death, you from death, and he is the answer to death. But if we have millions of years of animals dying and turning into fossils like this Ida, that means death was around for millions of years before sin. And again, that whole idea erodes our confidence in the very gospel. Is this making any sense? So when did that fossil form? When did Ida get splat, covered with mud? I think it's related to Noah's flood. Noah's ark, Noah's flood, lots of water, lots of mud. And so when was Noah's ark, Noah's flood, with all that water and all that mud? Was it before sin or was it after sin? After sin. So it solves the theological dilemma of death before sin. Just move those fossils to the flood. The flood provides the water you need to cover these things anyway because you've got to have a lot of water to make a fossil. Fossils don't form today. Lemurs don't get covered in mud and turn, it turned into fossils. Birds don't either, but all, uh, all the continents of the world have fossilized birds mixed with di- the dinosaurs, by the way. So that's the first category is just a dead animal. What about Lucy as a second example? Uh, when I was a kid, Lucy was it. I mean, Lucy, and here it is pictured in the sixth grade um, California textbook just from a few years ago, showing Lucy as our ancestor for sixth graders. Uh, so let's tee it up. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm, maybe I've lost you. <laughs> maybe I should be more demonstrative. A bigger golf ball. Let's tee it yeah. up. Yes. This is the claims that came out in 1974. Made the cover of Nat Geo, of course, as usual, because it's a, you know, possible missing link. Uh, lumbar curve. Lumbar curve. That's uniquely human, you know. We'll talk about that in a second. Human like pelvis, that's also uniquely human. Apes, their their pelvis is structured so that their femurs go out. So when when apes walk, well, I'll show you in a minute. Their their knees aim out, okay? But with us, our knees aim forward so we can walk with this um, uniquely human gait, G-A-I-T, gait. Uh, Human like knee, that was the claim, and and then a human like foot. Um, very human-like foot. Ooh, let's let's go ahead and do this. I wonder if this will play from here. That's not the right button. Um, maybe I need some help from the back. Sorry about that. Uh, so there's a little video on that slide, and I'm not used to using this to play it, so... Do you reckon you could get it to work? Look at these awesome tech dudes. Well, let's do this. While the while that's doing whatever it's doing, um, let's just um, illustrate that you're a human um, this morning. So everybody stand, stand up, and then to illustrate that you're a human. When this kicks on, we'll um, transition to the slide again, but. For now, just pay attention to my instructions. So, 
lumbar vertebrae. Those are the backbones that are in your lower back. And so for us, they enable us to have a twisting motion. And in fact, you do that twisting motion every time you take a step. So if you were to, if you were to take a left foot forward, try that left foot forward, okay? And like you're about to take a step, your which shoulder swings forward as you're going to take that step? Okay, so when left foot forward, right shoulder forward. Right foot forward, left shoulder. And so there's a little bit of a twist. Let's do the twist. So you do the twist every time you take a step. Is that thing not going to play for real? Hmm, okay. Well, it shows, it's a, it's a video that shows a, a, a human walking, and it tracks it on a, on a, on a motion uh, capture, and then it shows a chimpanzee walking, tracking that on a motion capture. Chimpanzees, on the other hand, um, they have a stiff back, which is great for support when you're hanging from branches and trees. Uh, but that means they can't do the twist. They have a stiff C-shaped uh, uh, back, basically. Uh, and so we have an S-shaped back, and we, ha we can do the twist. So, so here's what you've got to do to demonstrate that you're a human. You, you can do this. Chimps cannot. Leaving your feet aiming forward, turn around and say hi to the person or wall behind you, just like this. Leaving your feet planted. Hey, you are twisting your back. You're real people. That's great. Okay, now, good job. What would you do if you were a chimp? How would you say hi to the person behind you if you're a chimp? You got to move your feet. That's it. Do it. Show me the chimp. Yeah. And then we say hi to the person. You got to shuffle those feet. So, congratulations, you're uniquely human. Good job, have a seat. Thank you. Well, let's just go to the next slide and we'll skip the video slide if you don't mind setting that back up. Well, regarding Lucy, uh, this, uh, the claim was made that Lucy had a, um, a, 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 an S-shaped curve and had, it could do the twist because you've got to be able to do this. Cause, so when chimps walk, um, they have that stiff spine. So with the left foot forward, their left shoulder comes forward. So chimps walk like this. And, and this is fun. This is fun to try. And it's fun to, know, to think that I actually get paid to, to do this right now. <laughs> so that's kind of nice. Um, what about Lucy for real? Guess what's not even there among the skeletal remains? Okay, this is the worst kind of science. Because there's nothing even to observe. Science should at least be about what is, you know, that which is observable, but if there's no bones there, then all they're doing is telling stories. Storytelling. Okay, no bones there. Uh, what about the knee? It's supposed to be a human-like knee, found 200 feet uh, deeper and uh, uh, several uh, hundred feet away from the rest of the remains. I think the knee was probably a human knee. No wonder it's like human. But the rest of it is just extinct apes. Ape-like inner ear. Uh, ape-like thumb. It had locking wrist. Lucy had locking wrist. So Lucy, everything about Lucy was, um, oh, ape-like big toe. Lucy had hands for feet like modern chimpanzees have. Hands for feet. Great for what? Grasping trees, tree branches. But Lucy was really great for living in a tree. So if you go to the Creation Museum over there in Kentucky, you'll see an anatomically correct Lucy uh, model on display. And um, they just covered theirs with hair. And uh, I think that's probably appropriate. Well, don't take my word for it that Lucy was just an ape. Uh, take Stern and Sussman's word. They said, Lucy would have walked bent hip like this, because they, they can't straighten up their back like this. Bent hip, bent knees, rather like a chimpanzee. So that if you walk, they prefer to knuckle walk, but if they can walk, it's an inefficient gait. They have to waddle when they walk, uh, chimps as well as Lucy. So we get to, let's knock it out, but don't take my word for it, just take Solly Zuckerman, Sir Solly Zuckerman's word for it. He said they are just apes. Oh man, just apes. Having nothing to do with human ancestry, just an extinct ape. That's what they say about it. So it's a second example of the same category, animal, dead animal. So that challenges, that challenges nothing about um, Genesis, in fact, just because there's a dead ape means there's, there were apes created in the beginning. Some of those apes died in the past. 
and uh, probably Ice Age um, catastrophes in Africa, buried those apes and fossilized them after the flood. And then um, there's still some apes alive today that survived all those rigors of, of the past so far. So that's two examples. Now let's take an excursion, because I went to the Denver Museum of Science some years ago, and I saw their model of Lucy. And it looked very different from the Creation Museum's model of Lucy. And I looked at this Lucy's eyes, and I thought, what's going on with those eyeballs? And it's, it's the same kind of thing you see with the, um, the Planet of the Apes movies. And they stick human eyes into these ape skulls. Do eyes fossilize? I've seen fossil retina. That's it, retinal material. But, that, but no, no eyeballs. Well, it turns out that human eyes are totally unique and distinct. And we use our eyes, just our eyeballs, to communicate sometimes. No animal can do, can do this at the dinner table, for example. Mom... Rolling of the eye. Only we can do that. That's uniquely human means of communication. Only we can do this. Who am I looking at? You see, okay, you're like, I'm not going to admit that he's looking at me. <laughs> but if I'm an animal, my, my whole head aims at where I'm looking. Look where they can wiggle their eyes a little bit. But humans can look at right at the side of their eye. You know, uh, and we, so we have side eye glance. We have all these expressions of communication that are uniquely human. And how, how can we do that? Because we have visible whites. The sclera are visible. So that we can do all these odd directional mov movements and we can communicate with that dimension. It's part of being made in the image of God. It's part of being able to have intimate, interpersonal communication. God made us that way and he made no animal that way. Zero. So why? Why would they stick human eyes into this, into this ape skull? And, and by the way, they have... They have human hands on their Lucy, they have a human back, spine on their Lucy, which is wrong, and they have uh, human feet on their Lucy, and which is also wrong, they had hands for feet. And they also have this upright posture for Lucy, also wrong, 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 wrong. And then of course not very much hair on it, which makes it look really human-like. Well, how, what about these eyes? Now here's some more examples of, of models. On the left we have a, uh, I think... Um, Based on, a, based on a fossil from Australia, human. That's human. He just needs a haircut, that's all. And they put human eyes into this human skull, no problem. Um, next, human. I think they made her nose too wide. That doesn't fossilize either, the soft stuff here. Uh, but human eyes in a human skull, no problem. The third one, though, human eyes in a big ape fossil skull. I think it's a Dicamphus pithecus. Uh, known just from fossils. But on the right is an actual gorilla. And you can see there's very little sclera visible. So there it is. You've got human eyes, again, jammed into this ape skull. Why? The fossils don't demand it, but the guy who did the art revealed why he did it. He said this, I wanted to put a human soul into this ape-like face. Why? Because the data demanded it? Because the eyes fossilized? Because the science was so secure that I had to put human eyes in? No, none of that. Because I wanted to indicate something about her evolution. Talking about Lucy. He did a Lucy maquette also. So that's the reason. It's because these artists want to tell the story of human evolution. And so beware. Look at those eyes. I don't know. what. Don't look at the eyes. How about that? Well, th was that worth it, the eyeball excursion? Yeah, they shouldn't put those eyes in there. I guess it's a negative message. Sorry to be negative this morning, but I like it when they put the right eyes, you know, animal eyes in animal skulls, so that's good. Let's, let's end on a positive. And then we'll go to the next example, which is Homo habilis silhouette. It up. So there I am hold, holding a, um, a model skull of Homo habilis. Well, here's the thing. Most paleoanthropologists say Lucy was an ape, a unique kind of ape. Modern man's very different. Every single bone. I mean, you have a jawbone. You have a, you have a radius. You have an ulna. Every single bone 
is, is form-fitted to connect with the next bone. So every single eighth version of the bone connects with the next eighth version of that, of that same bone. And so in order to transform a Lucy into a human, you have to form-fit, you have to adjust every angle, every size and shape of every single bone. It's a lot of adjustment. Here's a big adjustment you have to make, just one of hundreds. In all the apes, the spine uh, um, attaches to the skull, to the back of the skull. There's a big hole in the back called the foramen magnum, which is Latin for big hole. So the, the spine connects in the back because they're knuckle, knuckle walking, and that way they can walk on their, their th this pad here. They have big pads here uh, on their hands. And as they do so, they don't have to crane their necks up all day. Their, their heads are automatically positioned to where they, are, they feel most natural have, having their head this way. In contrast, humans, we have our foramen magnum in the bottom of the skull. So our spine comes right up from the bottom. And so that way we, are, we feel more natural walking like this. This is unnatural. Trust me. <laughs> so how are you going to get the spine to shift because when you do that, when you, when you shift the, the frame and magnum from the back to the bottom, you also have to rotate the inner ear, the organ of balance. And so that has to be positioned right. And then you have to position the next piece and the next piece. And if you don't position all the pieces at the same time, you end up with a giant misfit. Uh, we don't see the misfits, but we've got to find the misfits. We have to find the transitional ones. And so we're always looking, always looking. And Homo habilis was supposed to be the transition um, because it was, well, here's, here's the story of how it was sort of first found. 1959, there was ape skull bits along with other animal bits uh, and, and stone tools. Wait a minute, so, there's a st so here's, a, here's a bone pile. You've got turtles and turtle bones and ape bones and other kinds of bones. And it looks like stone tools were used to, uh, to process meat. And they're mixed in there with the bones also. And so the scientist, Mary Leakey, the, leading, uh, the leader of them, she, um, she took the eight bones and the stone tools, put them together and told a story about them and said, these apes must have been using these stone tools. So we're looking at fossils of really smart apes. So we're imagining that their intellect was evolving even though their anatomy was not. Their anatomy was ape but their brains were becoming human brains. They were able to use tools. That's the story that was told. Now, can you this morning think of a different story that accommodates the same data? Okay, let's do the raising of the hands thing. Uh, yes, sir, yeah. Uh, it's a butcher shop. Yeah, so they got really hungry. They got so hungry, they were ready to eat an ape. Okay. So at a butcher shop, do you throw your own carcass into the meat bones pile? <laughs> no, you don't. So it's animals that they ate. So that's, my, that's an equally valid interpretation of the same data. Um, well, it was, it was published, in, it was announced, and then later on published. Um, and it's, it was the only candidate. Um, but it turned out to be um, uh, just a story told, wrapped around some uh, ape bones, fully ape bones, okay, on that one. And it ignored skeleton OH1, Oduvai hominid 1, which was fully human. It was down in these ape. Okay, so here's the, here's the model. We have, we're supposed to have our ancestors in layers below, and then we're supposed to have modern human um, bones in layers above, deposited later. And we're supposed to see this evolutionary progression of ape transition, transitional to man, and then fully man on top of that. And then there's age assignments to these layers. But instead, what we found is eight bones in these lower layers and human bones in these lower layers, too, like this one, found uh, 1913, and nobody talks about it. But it, there it is already down there in the lower layers. And then we find no transitions. We, set, we find eight bones and human bones in this layer, too, and then eight bones and human bones in the upper layers also. So they're, they're jumbled up. They're not in an evolutionary um, progression at all. So I've got this picture of Frankenstein because I think uh, Homo habilis reminds me of Mary Shelley's classic work where, you know, you get a, you get a brain from over here and, a, and an arm from over there and, 
a leg from this carcass and you sew them together and zap it with electricity and voila, it's alive. Uh, so, but it's all manufactured and there's no actual fossil that shows any transitional feature. You either have um, apes or men, or sometimes human bones and ape bones positioned together even though they don't belong together at all. And just take their quote, don't take my word for it if you don't want my word. Robinson considers that the original Homo habilis was a conflation. Not a real thing, guys. A conflation. They're admitting this of apes and humans. Taking ape bones, human bones, pretending like they belong together. That's what they're saying about it. So we get to let them, so let's knock it out. Homo habilis is an all-embracing wastebasket species. By the way, paleos... Paleo rock stars don't even use it anymore. They don't use habilis, hardly at all. A variety of fossils could be conveniently swept. Here's another quote. Although the transition from apes to humans, notice the transition taken as fact, before they even analyze the data, they have a mental construct as though there was, there was a transition. You can't doubt that there was. Well, I'm here to doubt that there was even a transition. And I'm saying, I don't see any evidence in the fossils to suggest or support the idea that there even was a transition. So I would say, although the supposed transition from Australopithecus to Homo, from apes to human, is usually thought of as a momentous transformation. And by the way, it should be thought of as a momentous transformation, because you'd have to transform the shape of every single bone in the entire body to get from one to the other, let alone the soft part, let alone all the DNA. Uh, uh, is usually thought of as momentous transformation. The fossil record, this was published in 2017, way back then. Uh, the fossil record bearing on this transition is virtually undocumented. We don't have any missing links. They're admitting we don't have any missing links, so there's no, um, uh, there's no legitimate um, fossils that belong in, in Homo habilis category. In fact, they don't, have, they don't even have a single Homo habilis uh, skull. It's just Fragments of bits and bones, okay? So it turns out that that's our, that's our example of our second category. First category was what? Animal. So, so dead animal. Second category here is animal parts mixed with human parts. Animal plus human. All right, so if someone takes animal parts, mixes them with human parts, pretends like they belong together, does that mean I have to take an exacto knife to Genesis or to 1 Corinthians and say, Paul got it wrong? Not at all. What I need to do is take an X-Acto knife to the museum placard. You know, when you go to the museum and it says, this is your ancestor. But the thing is that the this isn't always a real this. It's a, it's a Frankenstein. It's, a, it's imagination wrapped around selected bits of bones. So animal plus human is what we found. And it's not just me saying it. I'm just quoting from the evolutionists who refute themselves. Uh, okay, so that leads us to our last example. So let's tee it up. Last example uh, is Neanderthal man. Neanderthal man. And uh, I got a picture of this Time Life book. You know, Time Life, it's like a family book full of pictures that I read when I was a kid back in the 1870s, a long time ago. And what I was told in this little book um, is that Neanderthal man was my ancestor. I evolved from a brutish, ape-like, sloped forehead, big, bad, beetle-browed dude, and he dragged a club and he dragged his women around by one hand in e on each, okay? And so that was the, that was the idea that I had. Um, but since then, we've discovered several things. We've been able to, scientists uh, have been able to... Um, sequence the DNA, uh, the ancient DNA. It's been damaged, uh, you know, because it's been buried. Uh, and, um, so they have to do lots of digital reconstruction. And, and, but it's a pretty good sequence. It's pretty solid. And um, they compare it with modern humans, and they find a match. So it's, uh, it's, it's human DNA. So we're looking at humans, these Neanderthal people. Um, anatomically, they have their foramen magnum in the bottom of the skull. They've got every, every, all the basic features of humans. And in fact, you know, the sloping forehead, there's people like me who have sloping foreheads even today. And they're just, they're smarter than me. I'll show you pictures of them. I could. 
I think I had them. But you can find them. People with sloping, and there's people with big, thick eyebrows even today. In fact, every trait that we um, find in the Neanderthal human remains, of which there are hundreds, mostly in Europe, some in um, Israel, and one in China, uh, every one of those unique, you know, those traits exist in somebody distributed in today's population. Okay, so they were people had human DNA. Um, I remember, I remember um, at the the Field Museum in Chicago. I was there checking out what what they had on display, and there's a little girl in front of me, and we both turned the corner into the Human Origins exhibit, and she had a little notepad in front of her. And we, we, she was right in front of me, and uh, we turned the corner, and boom, there's a guy with no shirt wearing a grass skirt staring at us behind, you know, from behind a pane of glass. And we're, like, right there, and we're both shocked. Like, bro, put a shirt on, uh, you know. But then, but then it took us a second to realize, oh, that's a model, but it's a really good model. Like, I don't know how they made the rubber skin look like real skin, but they did it. And um, so then, so then we're, we're assuming the posture of the model here. And the little girl starts writing something, and I said, you know, if you just gave that guy a suit and a haircut, and he were to walk around the streets of Chicago, you would never notice. He'd just blend right in. And so she looked at me, a stranger, and she looked at the model, and she goes, yeah, you're right. And so I thought, hey, it's nice to be right when, every once in a while. So anyway, so their burials were, uh, they married moderns, we know, because they have... Uh, Modern, anatomically modern, which looks like straight up forehead, etc. Buried in the same layer as anatomically Neanderthals. Um, uh, they cooked their food, we know, from uh, their little fire pit remains. They made jewelry. They made musical instruments. These are all uniquely human traits. They buried their dead on purpose. Animals don't do that, and uh, uh, etc. So totally, totally human. Everything about them is totally human. And so we get to... Knock it out. I had some uh, folks come up to me after one of these presentations not long ago and say, and, and, and they, they, they got arm in arm and they came up to me and they were like, we have a, it's this one of these whispering questions. We have, we have a question. Okay, ask your question. We took the DNA test, you know, with the swab and you mail it in and you, you get your ancestry tests. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so, and they, and they said, uh, we came back partly Neanderthal. <laughs> is that bad? You know, they were so embarrassed that they were partly Neanderthal, they didn't know what to, to make of it. I just, I just wanted to say, here's what I wanted to say. Didn't you hear what I just said? They were people. Neanderthal people. But I said, oh, that's, that's interesting. So you, you, ha- you share the same sequence, partly, as ancient pe- ancestors of ours did. You know what? That makes you people. They were people, you're people, we have people DNA. So, makes sense to me. Anyway, so that's human DNA. Um, there's this claim out there that um, chimps and humans share almost almost identical DNA. It's a false claim. It's bad science, and here's one way to, to cross-check it. How much, um, how much chimpanzee, what's the size of the chimpanzee genome? How many bases or Base pairs are in the chimpanzee genome. It's 3.2 billion. How many are in the human genome? We have less DNA than chimps do. We have only 3 billion. So what's the percent difference between those two? Um, the percent difference is 6%. The percent similarity is like 94%, um, something like that. So, uh, so the claim of 99% DNA similarity between chimps and humans is false right on the surface. But then uh, we have scientists at the Institute, Dr. Um, Jeff Tompkins, who analyzed, he did a sequence comparison. We have a supercomputer that he was able to use to run the, the uh, base-by-base comparison. Um, I don't think he did base-by-base. He did chunk-by-chunk but um, because it's just so many. Anyway, he found an 84% similarity, and that's the same result that Richard Bugg found, 84. And he's a secular researcher at Queen Mary University. So it's, it's not 99% similar, it's 84% similar, uh, which means you've got, um, well, that's a lot of differences, actually. Um, so let's see, 84% is, um, well, that would turn into um, something like 900 
um, oh, I forget the number. It would be like writing a new encyclopedia uh, volume. If you just have a, a set of 40 encyclopedias, uh, 40 volumes in, a, in an encyclopedia, but to change that into the, the chimp um, encyclopedia into a human instruction building code to build a human body from a single cell, that's what you gotta do according to this code, this, this wiring diagram, um, you'd have to change uh, the, the equivalent of like one whole volume, uh, one, or, one or two volumes from that set. So in other words, you have to have natural processes invent new building instructions. When has anyone ever seen a natural process like wind, water, erosion, predation, construct any new building code? New coding always comes from a coder. Design always comes from a designer. And so that's why we are confident, more confident than ever, given this large gap in information, this large difference between chimps and humans in information. It's a big difference. You gotta have a lot of code. And we actually have in the Bible a real person who can do code writing. And uh, so he's called the Lord Jesus. And so we give him the credit for crafting each creature according to its kind and for making mankind according to our uh, kind. So the third category is human. Guys, people died. People died. Neanderthal people died. Other kind of people died. Does that mean that I have to erase Genesis because of people been dying? Not at all. But we do need rescue from death. So we look forward to that day. And what we end up with is um, this icon here. You know this icon of small to large, simple to complex, ape to human? The fossils don't show this icon. Uh, this is just a positioning. It'd be like taking a scooter, a motorcycle, and a car, and then an airplane, and pretending like one evolved into the next. It's just silliness, and the fossils show a total mix-up where humans are down there, humans are also up here, apes are down there, apes are also up here, and so they're, they're admitting it too. Publishing in Nature not that long ago saying, we have all seen this canonical parade, I call it the fake parade of apes, each one becoming more human. We know, we scientists, we experts know that as a depiction of evolution, this is nonsense, yet we cling to it. Why do we cling to it? Because it illustrates what we want people to think. It illustrates what we believe. But we have to hold these beliefs about human evolution in spite of the evidence. And what I'm saying is, faith in Christ as the creator is no longer a leap of faith in spite of evidence. It's now a step into the light of the evidence. Well, you can equip yourselves with more of this kind of information. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, some... We have some options for you today. The, the Cadillac of this whole topic is a book called Contested Bones. It's one of our most expensive, but it's... I didn't scroll that. I'm still talking about this one. Uh, it's, um, it's Contested Bones, so it's a great resource if you want to look at... You have, you have questions about other fossils. Uh, you have, what is this thing doing? Okay, I guess it's on, it's, 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 it's on some sort of a loop. Uh, so uh, so, it, uh, so uh, there's a black book, a bone, uh, uh, the Creation Basics. And we brought more of that than any other title because we have two chapters on human origins. So if you have more questions on today's, this morning's equipping topic, human origins, get the book and you can get, the equip, the, get, get equipped. We have a spread that's a two-page uh, bit of information uh, on today's topic, also available in Creation Guide to Creation Basics. Uh, we've got Guide to Dinosaurs. This is family friendly. At least thumb through the pages and just appreciate all the artwork that we, and the layout that we did building these books. Guide to. I think they'll sell themselves. And what a, here's, here's our idea. Instead of burying great answers to origins questions, whether it be how do you do radioactive dating? What about the Ice Age? What about the dinosaurs? All these questions like how do you fit that in the Bible? Instead of burying that beneath just text, 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 wall of text, we thought, let's, let's wrap it around pretty pictures. That way the young folks can go, look at a picture, and then read about it and, and learn some new, get a new brick built in your foundation of science that supports Genesis. So that's what we did with these books. And then um, 
Uh, I wrote this booklet, Dinosaurs and the Bible, as a way to um, to point to uh, as, a, as a way to show how how. Well, I'll just tell you this. I gave a talk in Denton, Denton, Texas, years ago, and a lady came right down the front after I spoke, and she said, "You wrote Dinosaurs in the Bible," and I said, "Yeah, I." I did. I appreciate. She said, "I appreciate it." And she said, "When I read that book, it changed everything about the way I think." So this book was for her the transition from evolution to creation, and that's what dinosaurs, dinosaur fossils, give us the opportunity to do. So, so she said, "Can I take your? Pi- can I take a picture with you?" So her husband was there with the camera, and I was like, "Picture with me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Come on in here, you know." This, and so. Praise the Lord that he was able to use my book for what I was hoping uh, he could use it for. And then, of course, our free magazine, Acts and Facts, sent to your family's door um, uh, uh, every other month. And uh, it shows the latest science that we're doing. It shows some science that other scientists are doing. All the science that supports Genesis and makes Genesis more and more believable uh, to those with sort of uh, skeptical approaches and attitudes. So that's, that's what Acts and Facts does. And I've been reading it for 40 years, and I read every issue. And now I get to write for it, so that's kind of cool. cool. Um, in fact, this issue, and please take all of the copies so that we don't have any left after this morning. Uh, this issue has uh, Yellowstone National Park um, in it, and uh, that's, the, that's the article that I wrote. So I, I made the cover. Yay. So that's kind of nice. Okay. What are the three categories, class? Category one, dead animal category two animal plus man very good these are animal bones human bones pretend like they belong together but they don't category three human which of those three categories is undisputed missing link none so all the supposed missing links fit into these creation friendly categories and you'll find that as true as you look at these headlines moving forward which gives us confidence that genesis got it right You can trust God's word. You can trust God himself. Thanks.